days for June's Stock and Flock Talk. We've got Dr. Alan Young. Dr. Young is our dairy specialist. Dr. Young and I have done a number of joint things together, including uh, working with some Hooterites in Montana. We've been to Azerbaijan. We've worked for, with their veterinary school in Azerbaijan to uh, 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 increase their dairy industry technology capacity and education capacity. So he and I have traveled uh, internationally quite a bit, and I've got a few stories to talk about on Dr. Young. So, uh, Dr. Young, Alan, if you want to share your screen and take it from here. If uh, for those other folks, if you've got uh, questions, you can, I'm sure you can ask them. Um, and then there's a chat system here. And so in the background here, I'm going to try to figure out how to get into that chat system if somebody has um, a chat, a question, or, or whatnot. So I'll try to keep following that. Go ahead, Dr. Young. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure that this is one of those things that everybody's wondered about, but nobody's quite sure where we're at. Uh, I'm hoping that maybe I can uh, open your eyes a little bit and let you see that uh, some of this robotics has actually worked its way into the dairy industry, and it's probably going to change not only the industry, but also other areas of agriculture in the future. Um, how do I, okay, here we go. Uh, if you've noticed from the title of the talk, I've got robotics and precision ag, and I'm separating them into two entities. Most robotics will have some precision ag associated with it, but uh, for our talk today, I'm gonna show you that they are a little bit different than one another. Also, uh, you're going to see a lot of pictures that have red robotics in them. I'm not necessarily endorsing one company over another. It's just that I'm familiar with this company and their products more so than the others because it's the robotics that we have at the University Dairy, and so I know that one a little bit better. Uh, this spring, CoBank came out with their predictions of uh, robots and how it's going to affect the dairy industry. This is using a straight line, uh, three to five percent increase in the number of robots over the next uh, four or five years. Uh, based on what I'm seeing here in our area, I think this is an underestimation. Uh, so it's been kind of slow to take off and it's been geared more towards just small dairies but i think uh, as we go along you'll see that that's going to change very rapidly and so i think that this increase that you're seeing here in terms of being of having 1200 robots by 2022 in the u.s uh, is going to be an underestimation uh, people talk a lot about uh, the cost of robotics and whether or not it makes sense to put them on your dairy. Uh, this is a price analysis uh, on a per robot basis. Um, and if you notice in the title, it says that this is assuming no change in milk production compared to conventional milking. So if there's no change in milk production, uh, there's about a 10 to 13 year window in which it takes to pay off a robot. Uh, based on our experience at the university, uh, we had probably a 25% increase in milk production. And so that 10 year window probably is down around seven years or uh, eight years at the most. The other uh, interesting thing here is even though they are expensive uh, to put in and there is that time window uh, to pay them off, the resale value is very, very high. Uh, I met a week ago with one of the company uh, reps, and they were telling me that the resale value on these robots uh, for people who are trying to upgrade and you know unload whatever they had and go to the new, latest and greatest, the resale value is almost 50% of what they originally paid for it. Uh, 
uh, that's after five to eight years. So that's pretty unusual. Uh, hey, for, Alan, we have a question. Already? Oh. Yeah. So, oh. Alan, how does this compare? You said about 13 years. Is that compared to just paying it off, assuming milk production? But how, how does it compare to like a conventional parlor? You know what I mean? I mean, they need yeah. some sort of a milking system. So does it take them longer to pay it off versus a conventional parlor? Or is that pretty similar? Uh, it's pretty similar. It probably is paying them off uh, maybe a hair earlier, but it's going to be pretty similar. Uh, most farmers uh, depreciate their equipment as fast as they possibly can. So it's hard to say because they've changed the laws on depreciation. And uh, most, uh, if you do a straight line depreciation on farm equipment, they usually have it so that it zeroes out at about 15 years. Um, in this case, you could zero it out uh, basically at 11 or 12 years. Um, so maybe a hair faster, but again, because of tax breaks, most farmers try to depreciate their equipment as fast as they can so that it looks like it has very little value, uh, probably in a five-year window rather than a 15-year window. I got a question too. Um, the pounds increase was from what to what? On the cows, you said twenty five percent, but like oh. went from what to what? Our Holsteins went from seventy three pounds as high as ninety two pounds. We're right around eighty eight, eighty seven right now, but it went from seventy three to ninety two. Uh huh. And it's been, I mean, adjusting for days of milk, et cetera. I mean, has it's has it been maintained? Did they stay up pretty good? Yes. Okay. And in fact, uh, the Jersey herd, uh, they were all within about three months of drying out. And I expected that milk production to go down and, and, and they actually maintained their production uh, through all of the late lactation, which I was quite pleased with. Yeah. Are you supposed to sort of think that it's 20%? No. 5% increase or what is no. projected sort of typical? Projected, projected would be uh, probably, depending on if you're going from 2x to 3x, projected would be probably uh, 8 to 12 pounds of milk, something like that. So we were unusual in how fast we went up and how much we went up, but most of the projections are with 8 to 10, maybe 12. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, again, as part of CoBank's uh, report, they were looking at global shares of milking robots by type. So the pictures that you're gonna see are going to be the standalone units uh, where there's one milking arm per one uh, box or robot. Uh, those have typically been put on smaller dairies and they make up the bulk of robots out there. There are a couple of companies that have uh, one arm that services multiple boxes. Usually uh, one arm services two boxes. So if uh, one box is empty, it, the robot can still keep milking in the other box. Um, the ones that we have out of the dairy would be considered a standalone. Uh, we don't have a multiple use one. And then the rotor units would be like carousels where you can milk multiple animals at a single time. And right now they're about 25% of the world market. I expect in the next few years to see that, num that percentage go up considerably. Uh, because la you'll see a slide here in a minute, but last fall, uh, the first robotic rotary parlor uh, became legal in the United States. And so it is now functioning and uh, working. And there's a lot of interest here in the West where we have larger dairies. And I think that now that there's a rotary robot out there, you're going to see a lot more of those go in, but typically up till now, 
standalones are a big share of that. Okay, so where are we right now? Uh, this is as of yesterday. Uh, I made a few phone calls. Uh, there's really three companies that have robots in this area, uh, Laley, Gia, and De La Val. You can see the number of farms there, and that percentage is actually pretty close to what the North American average for the number of robots that are being put in by the different companies. So as of right now, there's uh, eight, two, and one, and these are either completed in progress or under contract, and all of these will be finished by next spring. So all of these will be in total operation by next spring. Uh, you can see that there's 58 robots on eight dairies for Laley. There's two GIA dairies, one that has four robots, and the bulk of that uh, 16 to 22 is on another, is on one other dairy. And then D. Laval has one dairy across the border, just north of Preston, that has four units. Uh, so most of these dairies are smaller. Uh, two to four robots, but out of the Laley and Gia ones, there's three of those that are gonna be anywhere from 12 to 18 robots a piece. Uh, so think about that, three dairies that have uh, upwards of 18 robots uh, per dairy, and that's just in our area. Uh, here's an example of a milking robot. This happens to be Laley. Uh, can you see my mouse, Carrie? Uh, yeah, I can see your mouse, yep. Okay, so if you look over here, this display is the computer screen that they can see everything that's going on with the cow and also do some maintenance work um, in addition to uh, the normal milking procedure. So, this is uh, part of the arm and it swings out underneath the cow. Here's a better picture of it. So there's an arm that goes underneath. There's brushes that will clean the ends of the teats and then each one of the uh, units is uh, handled independently. And this part over here uh, on the right hand side with the cups is to steam clean each uh, one between cows uh, for sanitation purposes. Uh, while I'm here, I'll also sh mention that this platform that the cows are under, uh, for our dairy, we have load cells under that so we can get a body weight uh, for all of the cows every time they come in. But that's not necessarily true on all robots, but we happen to have that uh, for our robots. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the first robotic rotary parlor uh, just started in November <coughs> of last year. It's a 40 stall GIA, it's uh, designed to milk 600 cows 300, three times a day. Uh, the price tag was $70,000 a stall, and I did the math on that, and that's not quite $3 million for that robot. The interesting thing is that if you look at the older style rotary robots, the milking units were right here uh, at the back of where the cow would be standing and they would come up out of the floor. This new design has the milking unit underneath the uh, partition or divider between the cows and so it stays underneath of there until the cows are on, on the platform then it moves out underneath the cow, milks them, and then when it's done, it moves back underneath that uh, side uh, partition. So this is going to be a game changer, uh, I think, for a lot of people that are looking at robots and they're trying to make a decision, but they don't necessarily want to uh, do single box stalls. However, the largest uh, robotic dairy in the U.S. is in uh, Indiana, and they are projected to have 72 single box stall uh, ro uh, uh, robots. 
Right now, they're somewhere between uh, 48 and 60, but eventually they're going to have 72 on that one dairy. So there's still a market for both sides of it. Uh, it just depends on what you're willing to pay for and what your end goals are for this. Okay, switch a little bit. Uh, this is at the University Dairy. So this is... Hey, Alan, Alan yeah. before you get into feed, uh, on the box stall type of a, of a uh, robotic milker, uh -huh. how many cows... How what's the formula you use to calculate how many robots you need for the cow size or the herd size? Uh, uh, a ballpark is somewhere between fifty-five and seventy cows per robot. Uh, most people shoot for around sixty, but depending on production and box time, box time means how fast that they an individual cow can be milked. Uh, you can manipulate that a little bit one way or the other, but usually they start out at 60 cows per robot and then adjust it uh, from there. Uh, I, I think that it really depends on production level as much as anything. Uh, our robots are free, which means that there's not a cow in there being milked. They're free probably 25 or 30 percent of the time, so we could probably put a few more in there, but uh, it really isn't going to make a lot of difference for us. And does, does our dairy, you can set how many times the cows are allowed to be milked. What does our dairy set that number at? So in a 24 hour period of time, the cow is able to be milked how many times? Um, it depends on their production, but uh, I think that we allow them to be milked anywhere from four to six times, but the herd average is three times per day. But we have some cows that are milked uh, five, some cows that are milked two, depending on their production level. So the goal is to have a minimum of 2.8 milkings per cow per day, uh, but we allow them to be milked every four hours if they really want it to be. Uh, if, if they're late lactation, then we may back it off a little bit just so they have enough milk to make it worth their while. But anyway, that's the goal. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to switch over to feeding. Uh, this is a... Can I ask a question quick about the milking? Yeah. That you were talking about? Did, did you say something like eight times a day? No, I said every four hours. Oh, I thought you said two to eight. I usually never hear of a milk in more than maybe like six, but it's sometimes it's four point something average. Is that that's, how it goes? No, that's four. Four is high. Uh, we have anywhere from two to six milkings yeah. per cow, but the average is 3.0. Okay. Sometimes we're uh, 3.2, 3.3, sometimes we're 2.9, but once they got up and going, uh, we've been pretty close to three as an average yeah. uh, all the time. I've heard of some places averaging over four. Do you think that's uncommon or? Um, I have not seen anybody, and I'm not aware of anybody that's averaging four. Okay. Um, I think it's probably pushing pretty hard if they can yeah. get that, mainly because uh, there's only 24 hours in a day, and if you have six minutes of box time per cow per day times the number of cows in a pen times three milkings a day, uh, you know, you sit down and do the math and it becomes harder to hit four per day on an, on average for all animals. There's okay. just not enough time. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're switching to feeding. Uh, this is a picture at the University Dairy. So this is a Juno. Its function is to push up feed and it does this automatically. Basically, it's got a 200-pound 
a block of concrete in the middle, so it's pretty heavy. Uh, once an hour, it's scheduled to go out and go and push up feed in front of the cows, and you can change the timing of that to anything that you want. Uh, but by pushing up the feed, uh, it encourages them to come in and eat more often, and it does this automatically, rain or shine, and you don't have to use someone else to go do it. Uh, the new and improved version of what you just saw is this Laley Vector. And again, I'm not pushing any one company, but I just know this is out there. Uh, basically, it will automatically go out and go to the kitchen area, which is where all the feeds are stored. And you can see that in the bottom right, you can see this thing that has, looks like uh, alligator or crocodile mouth that's open. Uh, you tell the computer what ration you want. This little scoop will go out, pick it up, put it in the hopper here, and it will mix this and then uh, go out and dispense it to whatever group of animals you want. And it will do this as often as the cows eat it. Uh, what you don't see here is a little electronic eye that looks at the curb height, and when the uh, curb, when this feed level gets below a certain point, it will go out and automatically mix a new load, then come back and dispense it out in front of the cows. It also does double duty so that if it's not making up a load and putting it in front of the animals, this bottom apron acts just like the previous slide and it will push feed forward uh, because it will revolve and go around and uh, push it up. Here's a closer look at it. The feed comes out right here. This bottom part down here is turning as it moves along and it keeps pushing it up in front of the animals and it will do this all day long, 24 hours a day. I've seen pictures where this will uh, actually go out in snow and ice and keep doing it, it makes its own path. As long as it knows where it's at and knows what the routine is, it'll just keep on going. Uh, if you're interested, the price tag on these is about $200,000. Uh, but it is a mixer wagon a push up uh, device and a computer feeder all in one. Um, the third robotics I'll show you uh, is called a Discovery. Uh, we have one of these uh, on back order. Right now the company can't fill the orders because there's so many of them, so there's a back order. Basically this is the manure handling system for the dairy. Uh, I think it looks like a little turtle and it just goes up and down uh, the alleyways and it vacuums up the manure. Uh, it has a bladder full of water in there and as it goes along it'll spray some water in front of it and then suck it up. It'll hold about 90 gallons of water, of manure anyway, and then when it's full it goes and docks, it unloads, it recharges. Uh, puts water back in, then it goes out and starts up right where it left off, and it will do this uh, as much, many times as you want it to go up and down. Cows uh, are not bothered by it. Think of it like your, a rumba in your house that goes and vacuums your floor. This is vacuuming your stalls. Uh, we're anxiously awaiting its arrival, but so far uh, it hasn't come. Uh, here's a couple of other pictures to show you. Uh, in the upper picture, you can see it started on the outside and has gone up and back, uh, down, and then on its next pass, it'll come up this way and then come back down again. Uh, if you're going to do something like this, you have to pour your uh, the concrete so that there's no curbs uh, in the crossover alleys. Uh, because if you do, then this can't clean that part of it. You'd have to do that by hand. But this will go out and clean uh, stalls. And I thought it was interesting to see that this is cleaning the stalls as this is pushing up 
over on the side here. Um, if you go to the University Dairy, you'll see that our, the bottoms of our gates are quite high and they're high enough so that this can go underneath all of the gates without stopping or having somebody unlock the gates. It'll just go out and do it automatically. Okay, so that's kind of a, a short course on some of the robotics that are out there for dairy. So there's milking, there's feed, and there's manure. So those are the big ones uh, that are tracking. So now I'm gonna switch over to precision ag. And some of the robots have some precision ag associated with them, uh, but they, it is kind of a different field. Uh, by definition, this is the use of technologies to measure physiological, behavioral, and production indicators. And this is to allow you to make better and more timely decisions about the health and performance of animals. Um, this is courtesy of Jeff Bewley, who was at the University of Kentucky, where a lot of these devices were tested. Uh, so this is blue in honor of University of Kentucky Blue. But if you look at all the different things, these different areas are all things that there are devices being tested or being marketed right now uh, to monitor a dairy cow. So you can look at fatness, uh, body condition score, rumination, temperatures, respiration, all of these different things. And I tried uh, in this slide to kind of uh, combine a lot of different things together. So uh, the top here, you can look at electrical conductivity and somatic cells. So you're looking at utter health up here. You're milk, looking at milk composition, uh, whether it's fat, protein, uh, metabolites, hemoglobin, BHBA, progesterone, urea, all of these are possibilities. Milk temperature. Uh, thermo uh, thermography, uh, whether it's the udder or animal, reproduction, which would be estrus and calving monitoring and detection, uh, rumination and rumen health, so uh, rumination uh, counts, uh, pH, uh, methane emissions, something to do with body weight or body condition scoring. If I'm I told you earlier that we take body weights, but some of the other companies, rather than give you body weights, will give you body condition scoring, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And then some sort of locomotion activity monitoring and lameness. And there are some people out there that are interested in knowing the location of animals, and so there's been uh, several companies that are looking at determining where uh, an animal is located on your uh, farm. I picked at random. I didn't, there was no rhyme or reason to what I picked other than I just thought they were interesting, but I just picked a couple to show you. This is uh, something called CavSense. It is a device that attaches to the tail and it is used to tell farmers when a cow is calving. So uh, it, the tail is, uh, changes angle for a certain amount of time, then it relays that to the dairy farmer to let the farmer know that a cow is uh, in the process of calving. Uh, basically, you can see that this is attached using high-tech things such as duct tape. Uh, you can transfer these between cows. You don't have to sterilize them. There's really nothing... Uh, special other than it just tells the angle uh, of the tail and how long it stays out there. Uh, so when a cow cal has calved, you just uh, cut this off and go put it on another animal. Uh, here is an example of body condition scoring. This works great in robotics, uh, but you can use this in any situation on a dairy where an animal moves underneath of a camera and they're setting these up so that it will take real-time monitoring so as a cow walks down an alley it can actually take a picture from above and uh, compute what the body condition scoring is 
At the bottom, you can see that uh, it's 100% accurate within a half a point of the actual, and within a quarter of a point of the actual, it's 93% accurate. So uh, basically, the technology for this is getting uh, really accurate, and I think this would be a really good addition on a lot of dairies. Uh, body condition scoring is quite subjective if you have several people out there taking body condition scores. So having something that is objective rather than subjective, I think, is a good deal. Uh, I don't know how this is going to play out, but they are also doing some work looking at feed intake uh, by looking at 3D imaging of the amount of feed that's left in a bunk and then computing uh, how much has been eaten by an animal by the difference between what it started with and what's remaining. Uh, this is still in the early stages of testing and development, but at some point I think that they'll have some version of this that's available. I wasn't sure quite where to put this because it fits kind of between the precision ag and the robotic part, and this is automatic calf feeders. Uh, this is not necessarily new technology, but it is computerized technology where you can have a group or a pen of calves that can come in uh, to a nipple, which is in this uh, upper right-hand side. They can walk in. Uh, there's a device on them that reads their ID and the computer which is inside here will mix up whatever the calf needs and dispense it out and feed them. Uh, I have seen some of these that have load cells underneath of here that will also give a body weight and, all, and that also goes back to a computer. So uh, during the day uh, you can follow the number of times a calf has come in, how much they've eaten, and also changes in body weight. Uh, again, it's all computerized. Uh, this room here in the bottom right-hand side is the same as this boxed area in the upper left-hand side here where my mouse is. Usually they can put about 25 calves in here per uh, feeder. Uh, some places will have two feeders, some will have one, uh, but again, it's a, another way of automating uh, a task on a dairy. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I want to at least show you the output for one particular cow. This is not a group, this is just one cow uh, to show you some of the information that you receive. So the black line is milk production. This light blue teal colored line is ruminations and this dark blue is activity. The pink is a probability uh, number uh, of the cow being in heat. So you can see this blue line or activity jumps up significantly and then you see the pink goes up. Uh, that is uh, what the farmer will use to inseminate an animal because this will say that she's in heat. Uh, if you look through here, you can see there's ruminations go up and down, activity goes up and down as an animal moves. There's a little bit of a decrease in that, but for the most part, uh, the cow's moving along pretty good. Uh, same animal looking more recent in time. Uh, again, another heat event here based on her activity. But then a day later, you can see that her milk production goes down, her ruminations go down significantly, and also her activity level drops significantly. All three of those things would then be highlighted by the computer and show up on a list so that when the farmer goes in and pulls up the um, a list of animals that have a health problem. This animal will show up on that list uh, because of milk production, because of rumination, and activity being significantly uh, decreased. 
So lots of information. I'm only showing a part of it just to give you a, a feel for some of the data that comes out of this. Uh, here is something I look at. So every one of those squares is an individual animal on the dairy, and this is looking at rumination minutes per day, and I'm monitoring that to see if there's problems with the ration. So is this what the uh, office of a dairy is going to look like in the future? Um, there's a lot of debate as to whether or not this is where people want to go, but I can see there being a lot more computerization of things uh, in the future. So some of the technology pitfalls uh, are you've got everything from a plug and play to a plug and pray and a plug and pay uh, out there. Uh, depending on the services you get and what the product is, you can have any of these. Uh, some of these just uh, don't work as well as they're hyped to be, mainly because they go to the market too quickly and they're not fully developed. And a lot of them are not user friendly because uh, they have IT people who are doing a lot of the work on these. Uh, the biggest concern I hear from farmers is that they have three or four of these on the farm and none of them talk to one another. And so they have to open three or four programs uh, to figure out what's going on on the dairy when they would prefer to just open one program and have all of the data feed into it. And then finally, probably a big thing is there's a lot of data that's collected in these systems and what does it mean and what do you do with it? And I think that's always the question that you've got to answer with these is what are you gonna do with it? Uh, again, Jeff Buley from the University of Kentucky uh, surveyed a number of dairy producers and asking them about this precision ag information. And, so the top three or four here are basically uh, just a reiteration of some of the things we saw in the previous slide is uh, the technology is kind of ahead of what the knowledge base of the dairies are. Uh, they're a little bit squeamish about the costs and what the benefits that they're gonna get out of that. And then basically, what do you do with all of this information you have? I mean, they want something that they can just pull up a slide and it tells them what they need to know without having to dig too deep into it. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Mike Schutz, who's at Purdue University. He says, sometimes when you're sitting on the cutting edge, it hurts your butt. And I think that's kind of where we are at the dairy industry is uh, we're sitting on the cutting edge and we can't decide whether we like it there or whether it hurts. So in conclusion, uh, I'm convinced that robotics are here to stay. I don't see uh, them being diminished in any way. If anything, I think we're gonna start seeing more and more robotics in the industry. Uh, but what I think we're gonna see is that the job descriptions of the future are gonna be different than they are now, and there's going to be a requirement for a more technical background you're gonna be more of a computer programmer uh, than a warm body with a strong back. And so that kind of opens up some of the questions in my mind of who's gonna do the training for this and uh, what do we need to be training uh, our students for so that they can step into these jobs. I think that what we're seeing today in terms of this precision ag and robotics are pr primitive compared to what we're gonna see in 10 or 20 years. And to be honest, I don't think that we've even uh, come close to tapping into the potential of these. The big question that still is out there is there's an overwhelming amount of data and how are we gonna handle it and what are we gonna do with it? And I think that opens up some other areas that we can work in, but the the data part is a big deal. And my personal thing is, I'd say, bring it on. I think I, from what I've seen, it's gonna be a good thing and it's worth pursuing and looking for in the future. And with that, I'll open it up for any questions.